What is systematic theology? Many different definitions have been given, but for the purposes of this book, the following definition will be used. Systematic theology is any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today about any given topic? This definition indicates that systematic theology involves collecting and understanding all the relevant passages in the Bible on various topics, and then summarizing their teachings clearly so that we know what to believe about each topic. However, it is important to state at once that the study of church history, including the great creeds of the church and the writings of major theologians in church history, and the study of philosophy can often be of great benefit in helping us understand what the whole Bible in fact does teach about various topics. But they do not contain any authority greater than or equal to the authority of Scripture. 1. Relationship to Other Disciplines As my definition indicates, the emphasis of this book will not be on historical theology, a historical study of how Christians in different periods have understood various theological topics, or philosophical theology, studying theological topics largely without use of the Bible, but using the tools and methods of philosophical reasoning and what can be known about God from observing the universe, or apologetics, providing a defense of the truthfulness of the Christian faith for the purpose of convincing unbelievers. These three subjects, which are worthwhile subjects for Christians to pursue, are sometimes also included in a broader definition of the term systematic theology. In fact, some consideration of historical, philosophical, and apologetic matters will be found at points throughout this book. This is because historical study informs us of the insights gained and the mistakes made by others previously in understanding Scripture. Philosophical study helps us understand right and wrong thought forms common in our culture and others. And apologetic study helps us bring the teachings of Scripture to bear on the objections raised by unbelievers. But these areas of study are not the focus of this volume, which rather interacts directly with the biblical text in order to understand what the Bible itself says to us about various theological subjects. If someone prefers to use the term systematic theology in the broader sense, including especially historical theology and philosophy, as well as apologetics, instead of the narrow sense that has already been defined, it will not make much difference. Those who use the narrower definition will agree that these other areas of study definitely contribute in a positive way to our understanding of systematic theology. And those who use the broader definition will certainly agree that historical theology, philosophical theology, and apologetics can be distinguished from the process of collecting and synthesizing all the relevant scripture passages for various topics. Moreover, even though historical and philosophical studies do contribute to our understanding of theological questions, only Scripture has the final authority to define what we are to believe, and it is therefore appropriate to spend some time focusing on the process of analyzing the teaching of Scripture itself. Systematic theology, as we have defined it, also differs from Old Testament theology, New Testament theology, and biblical theology. These three disciplines organize their topics historically and in the order the topics are presented in the Bible. Therefore, in Old Testament theology, one might ask, what does Deuteronomy teach about prayer? Or what do the Psalms teach about prayer? Or what does Isaiah teach about prayer? Or even, what does the whole Old Testament teach about prayer? And how is that teaching developed over the history of the Old Testament? In New Testament theology, one might ask, what does John's gospel teach about prayer? Or what does Paul teach about prayer? Or even, what does the New Testament teach about prayer? And what is the historical development of that teaching as it progresses through the New Testament? Biblical theology has a technical meaning in theological studies. 
It is the larger category that contains both Old Testament theology and New Testament theology as we have previously defined them. Biblical theology gives special attention to the teachings of individual authors and sections of Scripture and to the place of each teaching in the historical development of Scripture. The term biblical theology might seem to be a natural and appropriate one for the process I have called systematic theology. However, its usage in theological studies to refer to tracing the historical development of doctrines throughout the Bible is too well established so that starting now to use the term biblical theology to refer to what I have called systematic theology would only result in confusion. So one might ask, what is the historical development of the teaching about prayer as it is seen throughout the history of the Old Testament and then of the New Testament? Of course, this question comes very close to the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today about prayer? which would be systematic theology by our definition. It then becomes evident that the boundary lines between these various disciplines often overlap at the edges, and parts of one study blend into the next. Yet, there is still a difference. For biblical theology traces the historical development of a doctrine and the way one's place in that historical development affects one's understanding and application of that particular doctrine. Biblical theology also focuses on the understanding of each doctrine that the individual biblical authors and their original hearers or readers possessed. Systematic theology, on the other hand, makes use of the material of biblical theology and often builds on the results of biblical theology. At some points, especially where great detail and care is needed in the development of a doctrine, Systematic theology will even use a biblical theological method, analyzing the development of each doctrine through the historical development of Scripture. But the focus of systematic theology remains different. Its focus is on the collection and then the summary of the teaching of all the biblical passages on a particular subject. Thus, systematic theology asks, for example, What does the whole Bible teach us today about prayer? It attempts to summarize the teaching of Scripture in a brief, understandable, and very carefully formulated statement. 2. Application to Life Furthermore, systematic theology focuses on summarizing each doctrine as it should be understood by present-day Christians. This will sometimes involve the use of terms and even concepts that were not used by any individual biblical author, but that are the proper result of combining the teachings of two or more biblical authors on a particular subject. The terms Trinity, Incarnation, and Deity of Christ, for example, are not found in the Bible, but they usefully summarize biblical concepts. Defining systematic theology to include what the whole Bible teaches us today implies that application to life is a necessary part of the proper pursuit of systematic theology. Thus, a doctrine under consideration is seen in terms of its practical value for living the Christian life. Nowhere in Scripture do we find doctrine studied for its own sake or isolated from life. The biblical writers consistently apply their teaching to life. Even those books of the Bible that have the most doctrinal content, such as Romans, Ephesians, and Hebrews, contain much material that is also directly applicable to the Christian life. Therefore, any Christian listening to this book should find his or her Christian life enriched and deepened during this study. Indeed, If personal spiritual growth does not occur, then the book has not been written properly by the author or the material has not been rightly studied by the listener. 3. Systematic Theology and Disorganized Theology – The Key Differences If we use this definition of systematic theology, it will be seen that most Christians actually do systematic theology 
or at least makes systematic theological statements many times a week. For example, the Bible says that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. The Bible says that Jesus is coming again. These are all summaries of what Scripture says, and as such, they are systematic theological statements. In fact, every time a Christian says something about what the whole Bible says, he or she is, in a sense, doing systematic theology, according to our definition, by thinking about various topics and answering the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today? How, then, does this book differ from the systematic theology that most Christians do? First, it treats biblical topics in a carefully organized way to guarantee that all important topics will receive thorough consideration. This organization also provides one sort of check against inaccurate analysis of individual topics. For it means that all other doctrines that are treated can be compared with each topic for consistency in methodology and absence of contradictions in the relationships between the doctrines. This also helps to ensure balanced consideration of complementary doctrines. Christ's deity and humanity are studied together, for example, as are God's sovereignty and man's responsibility so that wrong conclusions will not be drawn from an imbalanced emphasis on only one aspect of the full biblical presentation. In fact, the adjective systematic in systematic theology should be understood to mean something like carefully organized by topics, with the understanding that the topic studied will be seen to fit together in a consistent way and will include all the major doctrinal topics of the Bible. Thus, systematic should be thought of as the opposite of randomly arranged or disorganized. In systematic theology, topics are treated in an orderly or systematic way. A second difference between this book and the way most Christians do systematic theology is that it treats topics in much more detail than most Christians do. For example, as a result of regular reading of the Bible, an ordinary Christian may make the theological statement, the Bible says that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. That is a perfectly true summary of a major biblical teaching. However, in this book, we devote several pages to elaborating more precisely what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. And 12 chapters chapters 32 through 43, are devoted to explaining what it means to be saved in all of the many implications of that term. Third, a formal study of systematic theology will make it possible to formulate summaries of biblical teachings with much more accuracy than Christians would normally arrive at without such a study. In systematic theology, summaries of biblical teachings must be worded precisely to guard against misunderstandings, and to exclude false teachings. Fourth, a good theological analysis must find and treat fairly all the relevant Bible passages for each particular topic, not just some or a few of the relevant passages. This often means that it must depend on the results of careful exegesis, or interpretation of Scripture as generally agreed upon by evangelical interpreters, or, when there are significant differences of interpretation, systematic theology will include detailed exegesis. 4. Beliefs must be based on Scripture, not human authorities or traditions. Because of the large number of topics covered in a study of systematic theology, and because of the great detail with which these topics are analyzed, it is inevitable that someone studying a systematic theology text or taking a course in systematic theology for the first time will have many of his or her personal beliefs challenged or modified, refined, or enriched. It is of utmost importance, therefore, that each person beginning such a course firmly resolve to abandon as false any idea 
found to be clearly contradicted by the teaching of Scripture. But it is also very important for each person to resolve not to believe any individual doctrine simply because this textbook or any other textbook or teacher says that it is true, unless this book or the instructor in a course can convince the student from the text of Scripture itself. It is Scripture alone, and not conservative, evangelical tradition or any other human authority, that must function as the normative authority for what we should believe. 5. What are doctrines? In this book, the word doctrine will be understood in the following way. A doctrine is what the whole Bible teaches us today about some particular topic. This definition is directly related to our earlier definition of systematic theology. Since it shows that a doctrine is simply the result of the process of doing systematic theology with regard to one particular topic, understood in this way, doctrines can be very broad or very narrow. We can speak of the doctrine of God as a major doctrinal category, including a summary of all that the Bible teaches us today about God. Such a doctrine would be exceptionally large. On the other hand, we may also speak more narrowly of the doctrine of God's eternity, or the doctrine of the Trinity, or the doctrine of God's justice. The word dogma is an approximate synonym for doctrine, but I have not used it in this book. Dogma is a term more often used by Roman Catholic and Lutheran theologians, and the term frequently refers to doctrines that have official church endorsement. Dogmatic theology is another term for systematic theology. This book is divided into seven major sections according to seven major doctrines. Part 1, the doctrine of the Word of God. Part 2, the doctrine of God. Part 3, the doctrine of man in the image of God. Part 4, the doctrines of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Part 5, the doctrine of the application of redemption. Part 6, the doctrine of the church. Part 7, the doctrine of the future. Within each of these major doctrinal categories, many more specific teachings have been selected as appropriate for inclusion. Generally, these meet at least one of the following three criteria. One, they are doctrines that are most emphasized in Scripture. Two, they are doctrines that have been most significant throughout the history of the church and have been important for all Christians at all times. Three, they are doctrines that have become important for Christians in the present situation in the history of the church even though some of these doctrines may not have been of such great interest earlier in church history. Some examples of doctrines in the third category would be the doctrine of the inerrancy of Scripture, the doctrine of baptism in the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of Satan and demons with particular reference to spiritual warfare, the doctrine of spiritual gifts in the New Testament age, and the doctrine of the creation of man as male and female in relation to the understanding of roles appropriate to men and women today. Because of their relevance to the contemporary situation, doctrines such as these have received greater emphasis in the present volume than in other systematic theology textbooks. 6. The Difference Between Systematic Theology and Christian Ethics Although there is inevitably some overlap between the study of theology and the study of ethics, I have tried to maintain a distinction in emphasis. The emphasis of systematic theology is on what God wants us to believe and to know, while the emphasis in Christian ethics is on what God wants us to do and what attitudes He wants us to have. Such a distinction is reflected in the following definition. Christian ethics is any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us about which acts, attitudes, and personal character traits receive God's approval and which do not? Thus, theology tells us what we should believe, while ethics tells us how we should live.
There is some overlap in topics between theology and ethics. For example, marriage could be treated in both. But in general terms, theology focuses on beliefs, while ethics focuses on situations in life. A textbook on ethics, for example, would discuss topics such as marriage and divorce, lying and telling the truth, stealing and ownership of property, abortion, birth control, homosexuality, the role of civil government, discipline of children, capital punishment, war, care for the poor, racial discrimination, and so forth. Of course, there is some overlap. Theology must be applied to life, therefore it is often ethical to some degree. And ethics must be based on proper ideas of God and his world, therefore it is theological to some degree. This book will emphasize systematic theology, though it will not hesitate to apply theology to life where such application comes readily. Still, for a thorough treatment of Christian ethics, see my companion book, Christian Ethics, an Introduction to Biblical Moral Reasoning. B. Initial Assumptions of This Book We begin with two assumptions or presuppositions. One, the Bible is true and is in fact our only absolute standard of truth. And two, the God who is spoken of in the Bible exists and he is who the Bible says he is the creator of heaven and earth and all things in them. These two presuppositions, of course, are always open to adjustment or modification or deeper confirmation. But at this point, these two assumptions form the point at which we begin. C. Why should Christians study theology? Why should Christians study systematic theology? That is, why should we engage in the process of collecting and summarizing the teachings of many individual Bible passages on particular topics? Why is it not sufficient simply to continue reading the Bible regularly every day of our lives? 1. The Basic Reason Many answers have been given to this question, but too often they leave the impression that systematic theology somehow can improve on the Bible by doing a better job of organizing its teachings or explaining them more clearly than the Bible itself has done. Thus, we may begin implicitly to deny the clarity of Scripture, see chapter 6, or the sufficiency of Scripture, see chapter 8. However, in the Great Commission, Jesus commanded his disciples, and now commands us also, to teach believers to observe all that he commanded. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. Now, to teach all that Jesus commanded, in a narrow sense, is simply to teach the content of the oral teaching of Jesus as it is recorded in the Gospel narratives. However, in a broader sense, all that Jesus commanded includes the interpretation and application of his life and teachings, because in the book of Acts it is implied that it contains a narrative of what Jesus continued to do and teach through the apostles after his resurrection. Note that Acts chapter 1 verse 1 speaks of all that Jesus began to do and teach. All that Jesus commanded can also include the epistles, since they were written under the supervision of the Holy Spirit and were also considered to be a command of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 37. See also John chapter 14 verse 26, chapter 16 verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 15, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 2, and Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. Thus, in a larger sense, all that Jesus commanded includes all of the New Testament. Furthermore, when we consider that the New Testament writings endorse the absolute confidence Jesus had in the authority and 
and reliability of the Old Testament scriptures as God's words, see chapter 4, and when we realize that the New Testament epistles also endorse this view of the Old Testament as absolutely authoritative words of God, then it becomes evident that we cannot teach all that Jesus commanded without including all of the Old Testament, rightly understood in the various ways in which it applies to the New Covenant age in the history of redemption as well. The task of fulfilling the Great Commission includes, therefore, not only evangelism, but also teaching. And the task of teaching all that Jesus commanded us is, in a broad sense, the task of teaching what the whole Bible says to us today. To effectively teach ourselves and to teach others what the whole Bible says, it is necessary to collect and summarize all the Scripture passages on a particular subject. For example, if someone asks me, what does the Bible teach about Christ's return? I could say, just keep reading your Bible and you'll find out. But if the questioner begins reading at Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, it will be a long time before he or she finds the answer to that question. By that time, many other questions will have needed answers, and the list of unanswered questions will begin to grow very long indeed. What does the Bible teach about the work of the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible teach about prayer? What does the Bible teach about sin? There simply is not time in our lifetimes to read through the entire Bible looking for an answer for ourselves every time a doctrinal question arises. Therefore, for us to learn what the Bible says, it is very helpful to have the benefit of the work of others who have searched through Scripture and found answers to these various topics. We can teach others most effectively if we can direct them to the most relevant passages and suggest an appropriate summary of the teachings of those passages. Then, the person who questions us can inspect those passages quickly for himself or herself and learn much more rapidly what the teaching of the Bible is on a particular subject. Thus, the necessity of systematic theology for teaching what the Bible says comes about primarily because we are finite in our memory and in the amount of time at our disposal. The basic reason for studying systematic theology, then, is that it enables us to teach ourselves and others what the whole Bible says, thus fulfilling the teaching part of the Great Commission. 2. The Benefits to Our Lives Although the basic reason for studying systematic theology is that it is a means of obedience to our Lord's command, there are some additional specific benefits that come from such study. First, studying theology helps us overcome our wrong ideas. If there were no sin in our hearts, we could read the Bible from cover to cover. And although we would not immediately learn everything in the Bible, we would most likely learn only true things about God and His creation. Every time we read it, we would learn more true things, and we would not rebel or refuse to accept anything we found written there. But with sin in our hearts and with false beliefs rampant in our cultures, we retain some rebelliousness against God. At various points there are, for all of us, biblical teachings that for one reason or another we do not want to accept. The study of systematic theology is of help in overcoming those rebellious ideas. For example, suppose there is someone who does not want to believe that Jesus is personally coming back to earth again. Perhaps we could show this person one or two verses that speak of Jesus' return to earth. But the person might still find a way to evade the force of those verses or read a different meaning into them. But if we collect 25 or 30 verses that say that Jesus is coming back to earth personally and write them all out on paper, our friend who hesitated to believe in Christ's return is much more likely to be persuaded by the breadth and diversity of biblical evidence for this doctrine. Of course, we all have areas like that, areas where our understanding of the Bible's teaching is inadequate. In these areas, it is helpful for us to be confronted 
with the total weight of the teaching of Scripture on that subject, so that we will more readily be persuaded, even against our initial wrongful inclinations. Second, studying systematic theology helps us to be able to make better decisions later on new questions of doctrine that may arise. We cannot know what new doctrinal controversies will arise in the churches in which we will live and minister 10, 20, or 30 years from now if the Lord does not return before then. These new doctrinal controversies will sometimes include questions that no one has faced very carefully before. Christians will be asking, what does the whole Bible say about this subject? the precise nature of biblical inerrancy, and the appropriate understanding of biblical teaching on gifts of the Holy Spirit are two examples of questions that have arisen in the past 50 years with much more forcefulness than ever before in the history of the church. Whatever the new doctrinal controversies are in future years, those who have learned systematic theology well will be much better able to answer the new questions that arise. The reason for this is that everything the Bible says is somehow related to everything else the Bible says, for it all fits together in a consistent way, at least within God's own understanding of reality and in the nature of God and creation as they really are. Thus, the new question will be related to much that has already been learned from Scripture. The more thoroughly that earlier material has been learned, the better able we will be to deal with those new questions. This benefit extends even more broadly. We face problems of applying Scripture to life in many more contexts than formal doctrinal discussions. What does the Bible teach about husband-wife relationships? About raising children? About witnessing to a friend at work? What principles does Scripture give us for studying psychology or economics or the natural sciences? How does it guide us in spending money or in saving or in tithing? In every area of inquiry, certain theological principles will come to bear, and those who have learned well the theological teachings of the Bible will be much better able to make decisions that are pleasing to God. A helpful analogy at this point is that of a jigsaw puzzle. If the puzzle represents what the whole Bible teaches us today about everything, then a course in systematic theology would be like filling in the border and some of the major items pictured in the puzzle. But we will never know everything that the Bible teaches about everything, so our jigsaw puzzle will have many gaps, many pieces that remain to be put in. Solving a new, real-life problem is analogous to filling in another section of the jigsaw puzzle. The more pieces one has in place correctly, the easier it is to fit new pieces in, and the less apt one is to make mistakes. In this book, the goal is to enable Christians to put into their theological jigsaw puzzle as many pieces with as much accuracy as possible and to encourage Christians to go on putting in more and more correct pieces for the rest of their lives. The Christian doctrine studied here will act as guidelines to help in the filling in of all other areas, areas that pertain to all aspects of truth in all aspects of life. Third, studying systematic theology will help us grow as Christians. The more we know about God, about His Word, about his relationships to the world and humankind, the better we will trust him, the more fully we will praise him, and the more readily we will obey him. Studying systematic theology rightly will make us more mature Christians. If it does not do this, we are not studying it in the way God intends. In fact, the Bible often connects sound doctrine with maturity in Christian living. Paul speaks of the teaching that accords with godliness, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, and says that his work as an apostle is for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness, Titus chapter 1, verse 1. By contrast, he indicates that all kinds of disobedience and immorality are contrary to sound doctrine, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. 3. 
What is the difference between major and minor doctrines? It is appropriate to ask what the difference is between a major doctrine and a minor doctrine. Christians often say they want to seek agreement in the church on major doctrines, but also to allow for differences on minor doctrines. I have found the following guideline useful. A major doctrine is one that has a significant impact on our thinking about other doctrines, or that has a significant impact on how we live the Christian life. A minor doctrine is one that has very little impact on how we think about other doctrines and very little impact on how we live the Christian life. By this standard, doctrines such as the authority of the Bible, chapter 4, the Trinity, chapter 14, the deity of Christ, chapter 26, justification by faith, chapter 36, and many others would rightly be considered major doctrines. People who disagree with the historic evangelical understanding of any of these doctrines will have wide areas of difference with evangelical Christians who affirm these doctrines. By contrast, it seems to me that differences over forms of church government, chapter 47, or some details about the Lord's Supper, chapter 50, or the timing of the Great Tribulation, chapter 55, concern minor doctrines. Christians who differ over these things can agree on perhaps every other area of doctrine, can live Christian lives that differ in no important way, and can have genuine fellowship with one another. Of course, we may find doctrines that fall somewhere between major and minor according to the standard. For example, Christians may differ over the degree of significance that should attach to the doctrine of baptism, chapter 49, or the millennium, chapter 55, or the extent of the atonement, chapter 27. That is only natural, because many doctrines have some influence on other doctrines or on life. But we may differ over whether we think it to be a significant influence. We could even recognize that there will be a range of significance here, and just say that the more influence a doctrine has on other doctrines and on life, the more major it becomes. This amount of influence may even vary according to the historical circumstances and needs of the church at any given time. In such cases, Christians will need to ask God to give them mature wisdom and sound judgment as they try to determine to what extent a doctrine should be considered major in their particular circumstances. D. A note on three objections to the study of systematic theology. 1. The conclusions are too neat to be true. Some scholars look with suspicion at systematic theology when, or even because, its teachings fit together in a non-contradictory way. They object that the results are too neat, and that systematic theologians must therefore be squeezing the Bible's teachings into an artificial mold distorting the true meaning of Scripture to get an orderly set of beliefs. To this objection, two responses can be made. 1. We must first ask the people making the objection to tell us at what specific points Scripture has been misinterpreted, and then we must deal with the understanding of those passages. Perhaps mistakes have been made, and in that case there should be corrections. Yet it is also possible that the objector will have no specific passages in mind, or no clearly erroneous interpretations to point to in the works of the most responsible evangelical theologians. Of course, incompetent exegesis can be found in the writings of the less competent scholars in any field of biblical studies, not just in systematic theology. But those bad examples constitute an objection not against the scholar's field, but against the incompetent scholar himself. It is very important that the objector be specific at this point, because this objection is sometimes made by those who, perhaps unconsciously, have adopted from our culture a skeptical view of the possibility of finding universally true conclusions about anything, even about God, from his word. This kind of skepticism regarding theological truth is especially common in the modern university world. 
where systematic theology, if it is studied at all, is studied only from the perspectives of philosophical theology and historical theology, including perhaps a historical study of the various ideas that were believed by the early Christians who wrote the New Testament and by other Christians at that time and throughout church history. In this kind of intellectual climate, the study of systematic theology as defined in this chapter would be considered impossible because the Bible would be assumed to be merely the work of many human authors who wrote out of diverse cultures and experiences over the course of more than 1,000 years, trying to find what the whole Bible teaches about any subject would be nearly as hopeless as trying to find what all philosophers teach about some question. For the answer in both cases would include not one view, but many diverse and often conflicting views. This skeptical viewpoint must be rejected by evangelicals who see Scripture as the product of human and divine authorship, and therefore as a collection of writings that teach non-contradictory truths about God and about the universe He created. Two, second, it must be answered that in God's own mind, and in the nature of reality itself, true facts and ideas are all consistent with one another. Therefore, if we have accurately understood the teachings of God in Scripture, we should expect our conclusions to fit together and be mutually consistent. Internal consistency, then, is an argument for, not against, any individual results of systematic theology. 2. The choice of topics dictates the conclusions. Another general objection to systematic theology concerns the choice and arrangement of topics, and even the fact that such topically arranged study of Scripture, using categories sometimes different from those found in Scripture itself, is done at all. Why are these theological topics treated rather than just the topics emphasized by the biblical authors? And why are the topics arranged in this way rather than in some other way? Perhaps, this objection would say, our traditions and our cultures have determined the topics we treat and the arrangement of topics, so that the results of this systematic theological study of Scripture, though acceptable in our own theological tradition, will in fact be untrue to Scripture itself. A variant of this objection is the statement that our starting point often determines our conclusions on controversial topics. If we decide to start with an emphasis on the divine authorship of Scripture, for example, we will end up believing in biblical inerrancy. But if we start with an emphasis on the human authorship of Scripture, we will end up believing there are some errors in the Bible. Similarly, if we start with an emphasis on God's sovereignty, we will end up as Calvinists. But if we start with an emphasis on man's ability to make free choices, we will end up as Arminians, and so forth. This objection makes it sound as if the most important theological questions could probably be decided by flipping a coin to decide where to start since different and equally valid conclusions will inevitably be reached from the different starting points. Those who make such an objection often suggest that the best way to avoid this problem is not to study or teach systematic theology at all, but to limit our topical studies to the field of biblical theology, treating only the topics and themes the biblical authors themselves emphasize and describing the historical development of these biblical themes through the Bible. In response to this objection, much of the discussion in this chapter about the necessity to teach Scripture will be relevant. Our choice of topics need not be restricted to the main concerns of the biblical authors, for our goal is to find out what God requires of us in all areas of concern to us today. For example, it was not the main concern of any New Testament author to explain such topics as baptism in the Holy Spirit, women's roles in the church, or the doctrine of the Trinity. But these are valid areas of concern for us today, and we must look at all the places in Scripture that have relevance for those topics, whether those specific terms are mentioned or not, 
and whether those themes are of primary concern to each passage we examine or not, if we are going to be able to understand and explain to others what the whole Bible teaches about them. The only alternative, for we will think something about those subjects, is to form our opinions haphazardly from a general impression of what we feel to be a biblical position on each subject, or perhaps to buttress our positions with careful analysis of one or two relevant texts, with no guarantee that those texts present a balanced view of the whole counsel of God, Acts chapter 20, verse 27, on the subject being considered. In fact, this approach one all too common in evangelical circles today, could, I suppose, be called unsystematic theology, or even disorderly and random theology. Such an alternative is too subjective and too subject to cultural pressures. It tends toward doctrinal fragmentation and widespread doctrinal uncertainty, leaving the church theologically immature, like children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Concerning the objection about the choice and sequence of topics, there is nothing to prevent us from going to Scripture to look for answers to any doctrinal questions considered in any sequence. The sequence of topics in this book is a very common one, and has been adopted because it is orderly and lends itself well to learning and teaching but the chapters could be read in any sequence one wanted, and the conclusions should not be different. Nor should the persuasiveness of the arguments, if they are rightly derived from Scripture, be significantly diminished. In fact, I suspect that most listeners to this book will not listen to it through from chapter 1 to chapter 57, but will begin with the chapters of most interest to them and listen to others later. That does not really matter because I've tried to write the chapters so that they can be listened to as independent units, and I have added cross-references to sections in other chapters where relevant. Whether one listens to the chapter on the new heavens and new earth, chapter 57, first or last, or somewhere in between, the arguments will be the same. The scripture passages quoted for support will be the same, and the conclusions should be the same. 3. You can't just get doctrine directly from the pages of Scripture. This third objection is not about systematic theology in general, but about my particular approach in this book. Although many of the reviews of the first edition of this book were very positive, one criticism concerned the method I used in constructing the book. Why did I think I could go directly to Scripture? quote a number of verses, and then conclude that we should believe X, Y, or Z on the basis of those verses? Did I not realize that doctrines needed to be developed through interaction with the writings of the great theologians in the history of the church, and also with the writings of contemporary theologians who were famous in the academic world? Coming from evangelical faculty members who teach and write in university contexts where they often seek to influence other scholars who hold a more liberal theological position, such an objection is understandable. I have studied in such contexts myself at Harvard and Cambridge, and I would not write a book like this one in which I assume the understandability and the complete truthfulness, authority, and internal consistency of Scripture for the purpose of persuading other faculty members in such contexts. That is, because most or all of the non-evangelicals in that context would not share my belief that the words of the Bible are the very words of God and come with His authority. The basis of shared assumptions would be much narrower for such an audience. For most theologians who are outside the evangelical world, the words of the Bible are merely human words expressing human ideas about God. I should add the qualification that many Roman Catholic scholars would not consider themselves to be evangelicals, but they would also agree that the words of the Bible are words of God. And the writings of the great theologians in the history of the church are, similarly, human ideas expressed in merely human words. 
therefore, from their perspective, as we attempt to construct the doctrines that we should believe, all we have to work with are the human ideas about God that have been expressed both in the Bible and in Christian theological writings since the Bible was completed. That is why, today, evangelical students are still able to study the writings of theologians such as Augustine, Calvin, or Luther on an equal footing with liberal students and faculty members who also study those writings. They all agree that these are merely human writings, and so there is no fundamental disagreement on the question of authority or whether these writers might at times have been wrong. But in such university contexts, evangelical students would not find shared assumptions if they were to base their research and writing on the assumption that the entire Bible is the Word of God, and therefore absolutely truthful and absolutely authoritative. In fact, upon receiving a copy of the first edition of this book in 1994, my always gracious doctoral supervisor at Cambridge, Professor C.F.D. Moule, 1908-2007, wrote to thank me as follows. Note what he appreciates and what he does not appreciate. I am writing to thank you for your extremely generous gift of your maximum opus. I am filled with admiration, as I always have been, for your exceptional capacity for hard and accurate work. And Zondervan have done a very nice job, haven't they? I know you wouldn't expect me to agree with you doctrinally. We are poles apart in our understanding of authority, which is the basis of so much, but we can rejoice to have the same Lord and to be fellow members in the body. But I did not write this book to gain his approval. I wrote it for evangelical Christians who believe the Bible to be the very words of God written by ordinary human beings under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. See chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. In addition, I could never have written a book like this if I had tried to do it as a brand new believer, apart from the previous work of many theologians in the history of the Church. My understanding of the doctrine of Scripture was the result of reading the works of B.B. Warfield, J. Gresham Machen, and E.J. Young and learning from Westminster Seminary professors John Frame, Edmund Clowney, Richard Gaffin, and others, including my lifelong friend Vern Poitras. My understanding of other areas of theology had been heavily influenced by the writings of John Calvin, John Murray, Louis Burkhoff, Herman Bavinck, Charles Hodge, and the Westminster Confession of Faith. And all of those theologians had learned from the work of many who had gone before them, and they, in turn, had learned from others before them, going all the way back to the beginning of the church in the first century. At times in this book, I cite one or another of these authors, but even where I do not, for this is an introductory textbook, those who are familiar with their writings will recognize their influence. However, in the chapters where I deal with current differences of viewpoint among evangelical authors, I do cite and interact with the arguments of numerous other writers. In the end, however, I accepted or rejected various parts of all of their writings depending on whether, in my judgment, their viewpoints represented faithfully the teachings of the Bible itself, which I had been reading every day of my life for 39 years when the first edition of this book was published in 1994. So yes, while taking into account those valuable influences, I do think it is possible to build a system of doctrine directly from the pages of Scripture. But I would also say that this cannot be done well without an awareness of the theological convictions of other Christian writers throughout the history of the Church. E. How should Christians study systematic theology? How, then, should we study systematic theology? The Bible provides some guidelines for answering this question. 1. We should study systematic theology with prayer. If studying systematic theology is simply a certain way of studying the Bible, then the passages in Scripture that talk about the way in which we should study God's Word give guidance to us in this task. 
just as the psalmist prays in Psalm 119, verse 18, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. So we should pray and seek God's help in understanding his word. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Studying theology is therefore a spiritual activity in which we need the help of the Holy Spirit. No matter how intelligent a student might be, if the student does not continue to pray for God to give him or her an understanding mind and a believing and humble heart, and the student does not maintain a personal walk with the Lord, then the teachings of Scripture will be misunderstood and disbelieved. Doctrinal error will result, and the mind and heart of the student will not be changed for the better, but for the worse. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Students of systematic theology should resolve at the beginning to keep their lives free from any disobedience to God or any known sin that would disrupt their relationship with Him. They should resolve to maintain with great regularity their own personal devotional lives. They should continually pray for wisdom and understanding of Scripture. Charles Hodge, recognized as one of America's greatest theologians, taught at Princeton Seminary from 1820 to 1878. Princeton was at that time conservative in its view of the authority of Scripture. But for two years, 1826 to 28, he studied in Germany. When he returned to Princeton in 1828, he asked in an address to students how it was that in the former great centers of Protestantism, especially Germany, Christianity had ceased to be even a nominal religion. Hodge answered that the reason was the decline of what he called vital religion. Holiness is essential to the correct knowledge of divine things and the great security from error. Wherever you find vital piety, there you find the doctrines of the fall, of depravity, of regeneration, of atonement, and of the deity of Jesus Christ. Keep your hearts with all diligence, for out of them are the issues of life. Holiness is essential to correct knowledge of divine things and the great security from error. When men lose the life of religion, they can believe the most monstrous doctrines and glory in them. Since it is the Holy Spirit who gives us the ability rightly to understand Scripture, we need to realize that the proper thing to do, particularly when we are unable to understand some passage or some doctrine of Scripture, is to pray for God's help. Often what we need is not more data, but more insight into the data we already have available. This insight is given only by the Holy Spirit. Compare 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. 2. We should study systematic theology with humility. Peter tells us, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Those who study systematic theology will learn many things about the teachings of Scripture that are perhaps not known or not known well by other Christians in their churches or by relatives who are older in the Lord than they are. They may also find that they understand things about Scripture that some of their church officers do not understand and that even their pastor has perhaps forgotten or never learned well. In all of these situations, it would be very easy to adopt an attitude of pride or superiority toward others who have not made such a study. But how ugly it would be if anyone were to use this knowledge of God's Word simply to win arguments or to put down a fellow Christian in conversation or to make another believer feel insignificant in the Lord's work. James' counsel is good for us at this point. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 
James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. He tells us that one's understanding of Scripture is to be imparted in humility and love. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James chapter 3, verses 13 and 17 through 18. Systematic theology rightly studied will not lead to the knowledge that puffs up, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, but to humility and love for others. 3. We should study systematic theology with reason. First, it is right for us to reason from Scripture. We find in the New Testament that Jesus and the New Testament authors often quote a verse of Scripture and then draw logical conclusions from it. They reason from Scripture. It is therefore not wrong to use human understanding, human logic, and human reason to draw conclusions from the statements of Scripture. Nevertheless, when we reason and draw what we think to be correct, logical deductions from Scripture, we sometimes make mistakes. The deductions we draw from the statements of Scripture are not equal to the statements of Scripture in certainty or authority, for our ability to reason and draw conclusions is not the ultimate standard of truth. Only Scripture is. What then are the limits on our use of our reasoning abilities to draw deductions from the statements of Scripture? The fact that reasoning to conclusions that go beyond the mere statements of Scripture is appropriate and even necessary for studying Scripture, and the fact that Scripture itself is the ultimate standard of truth, combine to indicate to us that we are free to use our reasoning abilities to draw deductions from any passage of Scripture, so long as these deductions do not contradict the clear teaching of some other passage of Scripture. This principle safeguards against our misguided or incorrect logical deductions from Scripture. Our supposedly logical deductions may be erroneous, but Scripture is not erroneous. Thus, for example, we may read Scripture and find that God the Father is called God, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, that God the Son is called God, John chapter 20, verse 28, Titus chapter 2, verse 13, and that God the Holy Spirit is called God, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. We might deduce from this that there are three gods, but then we find the Bible explicitly teaching us that God is one, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, James chapter 2, verse 19. Thus, we conclude that what we thought to be a valid, logical deduction about three gods was wrong, and that Scripture teaches both a, that there are three separate persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each of whom is fully God, and b, that there is one God. But how can this be? In our human experience, we understand what it means to know three separate persons, three friends, for example. But these three friends are three separate beings. How can God be three persons and yet one being? Second, Christian theology can tolerate a paradox, but God never asks us to believe a contradiction. We cannot understand exactly how these two statements about God can both be true, so together they constitute a paradox, a seemingly contradictory statement that may nonetheless be true. We can tolerate a paradox, such as God is three persons and one God, because we have confidence that ultimately God knows fully the truth about himself and about the nature of reality, and that in his understanding the different elements of a paradox are fully reconciled, even though at this point God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. Another way of saying that we can tolerate a paradox is to say that we can tolerate a mystery in Christian theology. But a true contradiction 
such as God is three persons and God is not three persons, would imply ultimate contradiction in God's understanding of himself or of reality, and this cannot be. When the psalmist says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever, Psalm 119, verse 160, he implies that God's words are not only true individually, but also viewed together as a whole. Viewed collectively, their sum is also truth. Ultimately, there is no internal contradiction either in Scripture or in God's own thoughts. 4. We should study systematic theology with help from others. We need to be thankful that God has put teachers in the church. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. We should allow those with gifts of teaching to help us understand Scripture. This means that we should make use of systematic theologies and other books written by some of the teachers God has given to the church over the course of its history. It also means that our study of theology should include talking with other Christians about the things we study. Among those with whom we talk will often be some with gifts of teaching who can explain biblical teachings clearly and help us to understand more easily. In fact, some of the most effective learning in systematic theology courses in colleges and seminaries often occurs outside the classroom, in informal conversations among students who are attempting to understand Bible doctrines for themselves. 5. We should study systematic theology by collecting and understanding all the relevant passages of Scripture on any topic. This point was mentioned in our definition of systematic theology at the beginning of the chapter, but the actual process needs to be described here. How does one go about making a doctrinal summary of what all the passages of Scripture teach on a certain topic? For topics covered in this book, many people will find that studying the relevant chapters in this book and other systematic theology books and reading the Bible verses noted in those chapters is enough. But some people will want to do further study of Scripture on a particular topic or study some new topic not covered here. How could a student go about using the Bible to research its teachings on some new subject? Perhaps one not discussed explicitly in any of his or her systematic theology textbooks. The process would look like this. 1. Find all the relevant verses. The best help in this step is a good concordance or Bible search program, which enables one to look up keywords and find the verses in which the subject is treated. For example, in studying what it means that man is created in the image and likeness of God, one needs to find all the verses in which image and likeness and create occur. The words man and God occur too often to be useful for a concordance search. In studying the doctrine of prayer, many words could be looked up. Pray, prayer, intercede, petition, supplication, confess, confession, praise, thanks, thanksgiving, etc. And perhaps the list of verses would grow too long to be manageable so that the student would have to skim the concordance entries or search results without looking up the verses, or the search would probably have to be divided into sections or limited in some other way. Verses can also be found by thinking through the overall history of the Bible and then turning to sections where there would be information on the topic at hand. For example, a student studying prayer would want to read passages like the one about Hannah's prayer for a son, 1 Samuel chapter 1, Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple, 1 Kings chapter 8, Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26 and parallels, and so forth. Then, in addition to using a concordance or a search program and reading other passages that one can find on the subject, Checking the relevant sections in some systematic theology books will often bring to light other verses that had been missed, 
sometimes because none of the key words used for the concordance were in those verses. 2. The second step is to read, take notes, and summarize the points made in the relevant verses. Sometimes a theme will be repeated often, and the summary of the various verses will be relatively easy. At other times, there will be verses difficult to understand, and the student will need to take some time to study a verse in depth, just by reading the verse in context over and over, or by using specialized tools, such as commentaries and dictionaries, until a satisfactory understanding is reached. 3. Finally, the teachings of the various verses should be summarized into one or more points that the Bible affirms about that subject. The summary does not have to take the exact form of anyone else's conclusions on the subject, because we each may see things in Scripture that others have missed, or we may organize the subject differently or emphasize different things. On the other hand, at this point it is also helpful to read related sections, if any can be found, in several systematic theology books. This provides a useful check against error and oversight and often makes one aware of alternative perspectives and arguments that may cause us to modify or strengthen our position. If a student finds that others have argued for strongly differing conclusions, then these other views need to be stated fairly and then answered. Sometimes other theology books will alert us to historical or philosophical considerations that have been raised before in the history of the Church, and these will provide additional insight or warnings against error. The process outlined here is possible for any Christian who can read his or her Bible and can look up words in a concordance or use a Bible search program. Of course, people will become faster and more accurate in this process with time and experience and Christian maturity. But it would be a tremendous help to the church if Christians generally would give much more time to searching out topics in Scripture for themselves and drawing conclusions in the way outlined here. The joy of discovery of biblical themes would be richly rewarding. Especially pastors and those who lead Bible studies would find added freshness in their understanding of Scripture and in their teaching. 6. We should study systematic theology with rejoicing and praise. The study of theology is not merely a theoretical exercise of the intellect. It is a study of the living God and of the wonders of all His works in creation and redemption. We cannot study this subject dispassionately. We must love all that God is, all that He says, and all that He does. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Our response to the study of the theology of Scripture should be that of the psalmist who said, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! Psalm 139, verse 17. In the study of the teachings of God's Word, it should not surprise us if we often find our hearts spontaneously breaking forth in expressions of praise and delight like those of the psalmist. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Psalm 19, verse 8. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. Psalm 119, verse 14. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Psalm 119, verse 103. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Psalm 119, verse 111. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. Psalm 119, verse 162. Often in the study of theology, the response of the Christian should be similar to that of Paul in reflecting on the long theological argument that he has just completed at the end of Romans chapter 11, verse 32. He breaks forth into joyful praise at the richness of the doctrine which God has enabled him to express. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways! 
For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36.